This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Marta Kaufman. How you doing, Marta? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh my God, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, you know, I'm slightly geeking out because obviously I am of the generation of when Friends came about. So uh, I was in, I was there, I think I was their age when Friends was... Wow. So I'm about, I'm a little, like only a few years younger than the cast. So I was really feeling it. And I always wondered how, how can someone afford that apartment in New York? But we can get to that later. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and so we, I wanted to kind of go down the road uh, of how you started. How did you get started in the business? Um, honestly, I started um, as an actor. And... Um, discovered when when there was nothing in college for undergraduates to act in, uh, Dave and Crane and I said, well, let's write something that, that we can act in. And very quickly realized that the writing was a lot more fun than the acting. <laughs> yes. And we wrote a musical. Um, the following year, we wrote another musical that ended up off-Broadway. And... When that show happened, um, our theater agent at the time brought a woman named Nancy Josephson who said, why aren't you two doing television? And we went, eh. Um, and she is, to this day, still my television agent. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So you, so was there something that started you on the path of trying to even be in this ridiculous business that we call show business? What was the thing that kind of lit your fire? You know, I've always loved telling stories. Um, I didn't, growing up, know exactly what that meant. Um, but And it wasn't until I started studying theater and writing myself that I sort of said, "I there are stories I want to tell. There are things I want to say and things I want to do. And, um, you know, my mother was a dancer. My father could play any instrument you put in front of him. So I grew up oh, in a very creative household. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, as much as they didn't want me to go into the business, she told people for a long time that I was going to grow up and teach um, mentally handicapped people. I mean, told them forever wow. until I finally had to move to L.A. and said, you know, I'm really doing this. And she was furious. But once we, while we were still living in New York, we were going back and forth between LA and New York. And I had a baby at that time. Mm -hmm. um, David Crane was like the other parent. <laughs> um, we, we had one rule, I couldn't nurse during a pitch. That was the only rule we had. <laughs> That's a pretty decent rule. <laughs> it's a good rule. It's a good rule. And we were writing stuff and nothing was happening and nothing was happening. Mm. And um, then we got a meeting about Dream On. Interesting. And, um, you know, they were looking for writers to do something with these millions of, you know, tapes that they had of old TV shows. And um, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel talking to two, you know, musical theater writers. But we were able to come up with something and get it made. Right. Like it, it, it seemed like from your, from your pro, from your, uh, your filmography that, I mean, it seemed pretty quickly you got something, you know, you got a pilot produced, like, which was Dream On. And, uh, you know, and it, it seemed very, it seemed quick, but I always wanted to know, like, how did you get Dream On? Like how, cause it, it, it there's not a lot of time between when you first got your first writing gig to, being a showrunner, like you jump pretty quickly. And that generally doesn't happen in the business. You know, um, again, I have to thank Nancy Josephson for this. Um, when, when Dream On, right before Dream On happened, uh, we met with the agents and she was there and they said, what do you want to do? And we said, we want to write our own show. And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> You're too new to the business. Right. You've got to work on somebody else's show. And my feeling was, I have a baby. If I'm going to be spending time away from my baby, I'm going to have it be my thing. 
Um, and then Dream On happened. We wrote a pilot. We shot the pilot. And we were trusted to run the show. But, I, it's a miracle. I don't know who convinced who. Like, how does that happen? Um, like, in, I mean, I everyone, lis- everyone listening, you have to understand that this is not the normal route of things. You don't, you know, young writers are not given shows to run and that was an hbo show at the at the time right i think it might have had a little something to do with yeah it might have had something to do with h because it was hbo and hbo was in the wild wild west time period is that a fair statement yes it really was we were one of their first shows um and i think they were more willing to take big swings than than other places might have been a network would never have let us do this no way. I, that's yeah. So that makes that makes a lot more sense. Now, you- well, also simultaneously, um, we got a job, and this is what brought us out to LA. What moved us here, working for Norman Lear's company, developing TV. Mm-hmm. So that was also happening at the same time. Um, it was. We did a suspend and extend thing, which means we suspended the contract for a little while so we could do Dream On Mm -hmm. and extend it at that length of time. Um, And then we had to do both a show for them while we were doing Dream On. And David and I used to say we used to pass the baton on the freeway um, as we passed (laughs) each other going to the other room. (laughs) That's amazing. Now, your first writing gig was Everything's Relative. And and that was was your first official writing gig as a writer in a room? As a TV writer? Yeah. Well, I would say my first writing gig was we wrote questions for a a game show. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Um, But but we'll put that to the side for now. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, yes, that was the first. That was the first TV experience we had. So then, it as it was terrible. Which, which, okay. So I wanted to get into that. Was there a major lesson you picked up from being on that show as a young writer that you brought into the rest of your career? Um, well, one of the things we learned was we want to do our own show. Right. Um, we were not in the room for the rewrite, and the rewrite was massive. And, you know, we didn't have the experience to understand exactly how this works and that they're going to take it and put it in their own um, vernacular, um, you know, the way that their characters speak, which, you know, we watched the TV show. It was barely on the air for a minute before we did this. Um, <laughs> and um, it was a, 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 an experience where there was very little communication, very little right. inclusion um so yeah that was our first experience I and, forgot about that. thanks for bringing it up hey anytime i'm trying to bring up the worst yeah. and the best of your past <laughs> learning i'm trying to i'm trying to pick up some learning tips uh, along the way some lessons that we could give to everybody now what is uh, with, with you and da- you and david what is your writing process like how do you start you know a show idea or any kind of storytelling. How do you start? Like literally, your process. Do you wake up in the morning every day? Go to the to the desk at eight o'clock. I'm there. How's it work? So that's a very interesting question. And my process has changed okay. since David and I are no longer writing together. Right. I had to learn a whole new process. I used to say that I wrote out loud because David was always at the keyboard. Got it. He loved being at the keyboard, and I had to learn that. I wasn't going to be able to speak things out loud. So I started acting in my head. Um, And what I discovered about the way I write is that I write in waves. I'll sit down, um, study a scene, do my vomit draft is what I call the first draft. Um, Do that scene. And then I have to walk away for a little bit until the next wave comes and I know what the next scene's about and I sort of let the first scene settle and then let the second scene start to bubble up. And as soon as things start to turn in my head, I jump back in and ride the next wave. Now, sometimes it's more than one scene, um, but generally it's, it's, it's about riding waves as opposed to um, I'm picking these hours and these hours and these, I, I leave my day open. 
So it's just anytime that during the day you're just like, okay, muse, I am here. Yep. Anytime you want to show up, it could be at eight in the morning, eight at night, midnight, whenever. <laughs> well, it's a little more disciplined than that mm-hmm. in that I, if I know today is a writing day. Sure. I'll sit down. And the reason I call it the vomit draft is I know that to get started, I just have to get words on paper. Right. However terrible they are. Mm-hmm. The words have to go on the paper. And once that starts, once you get past the blank page, then the waves start to come, start coming. And it's, it's not really, I mean, yes, I do like to call my muse in, but it's not a matter of I'm in the shower, right. an idea happens, you know, and I jump out and go sit and write. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Well, I always love asking this question to creators you know, even when I write, there's that moment that, you know. Wait, excuse me one second. I realized I didn't really answer your question. Okay, so go ahead. Oh, yeah, it's a process. Um, the process. A, yeah, there's a little more about the process in terms of creating a new show. Okay. Um, there, there are a couple things. Sometimes there's IP. Right. Um, a book, an article, or something. And those can be incredibly inspiring. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a couple projects based on books and they're very exciting. And, and I hate to say this, but part of why they're so exciting is you don't have to start from scratch. You have a basic idea of characters and perhaps a shape of a story. And yes, it has to change. And it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a different process than when you're doing a show from scratch and you know here's the log line idea and then you have to discover who each one of these characters right. is right. and you have to discover um, what the story is and it is a painstaking process mm-hmm. it's a painstaking process but it's one that um, I mean generally um, it, it's one that I don't write down immediately. Okay. I, I percolate on it for a while. You let it simmer. You let it, yeah, you let it kind of, you know, saute in your head, if you will. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and I find that sometimes that the walking away is when my brain is most productive. Agreed. Uh, agreed 100%. It's, it's, it's sometimes you just got to go for a walk, go take a shower, go on a drive, whatever that right. thing is for you. I always found it, and, and this was a question I was going to ask you, with with creators, especially writers, I've always found the moment that you're able to tap into the flow. Uh, you said the wave, which is the first time I've ever heard it referred to as a wave, that you kind of ride a wave of inspiration or that the thing is coming through you. I always found it that we're almost conduits from something else. I don't know where it comes from, whatever you want to call it, but writers generally, and I think most writers I've spoken to have agreed with me on this, is that there's that moment in time where you, 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 you're you just writing and then you stop and you read it and like, who wrote that? Right. Do, do, you find, do you find that happening to you? Like you kind of like in that flow, it's not all the time. Sometimes it's, it's much harder than that normally, <laughs> but you get those moments. Um, the pilot of Friends was one of those moments. I'd imagine it is, yeah. It, that I mean, and, and mainly because we always say it wrote itself. Right. We didn't do anything. We just put the words on the paper. It just wrote itself. It's just something uh, so, some, from some other place. It just kind of like you guys were chosen. You're like, you two are going to do it, and right. it just all of a sudden. And I've I've heard that from 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 creators who've created these amazing properties uh, and television shows and movies that when it's when it's so well received around the world, it's generally like something that just kind of like, like Rocky and Stallone. Like when he wrote Rocky, he's like, I wrote it in three days, the rough, the first draft. Right. It was just there. It just, it was, it's like, who wrote that? And that's. It's like, it's a little bit like um, one of my favorite pieces of sculpture um, is, I think it's called the slave. Okay. Um, And it's a big, square piece of marble and coming out of the marble is a figure. The bottom half of this figure is in that big block of marble. Sure. 
it exists in there. You just have to find it. Right. The rest of that sculpture is in there. So, it, you know, it, it sort of makes me wonder if, if um, what we're doing is knocking away, m- removing all the stuff that gets in the way from the piece of work that you're trying to create. That's, yeah, that's well, is it, is it Da Vinci or Michelangelo yeah. who said that? I think it's one of the. Michelangelo. Yeah, yeah, he said that. He's like, yeah, I just, there was a, I just took the David, all the pieces that weren't the David. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which sounds so simple. Doesn't it? It, it doesn't, yeah, just, just right. It should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the other thing I think that gets in the way for a lot of writers, yeah. and I've spoken to writers about this, mm-hmm. but I think, Many of us feel like fakes. Oh, and t- imposter syndromes. Absolutely. Imposter yeah. syndrome. Oh, big time. It's it's a big thing. It's a big thing, which is what makes it so hard to face the blank page. <sighs> um, so hard to look at your vomit draft. Um, and, and I always said, I'm a rewriter. Mm-hmm. But, let me ask you, but, really what I am. but let me ask you a question, though. Why... Why do you believe that is? Because I've, and you're absolutely right, by the way. Me speaking to, I mean, Oscar winners and Emmy winners and everybody, they all, you know, they all seem to have that. Even after they've won Oscars, after they've won Emmys, they're super successful. And yet, every time they get onto the page, there's like, I feel like someone, I've heard this, like, I feel someone's going to come into the door and go, what are you doing? Security, get him or her out of here. Like, and it's, but it's a weird thing. Is that a thing? It's just an inherent in writers or in artists in general? Because it's not only writers. Directors feel the same way. Actors feel the same way. Why do you think that is? I think if you identify yourself as a writer, then your failures are more painful. Then mm. you think, I failed as a writer as opposed to, well, I'm not really a writer. So that's why that didn't work. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's a little piece of it. Sure. I think another piece of it is that um, as artists, we strive for perfection, which we never achieve. Right. We just want to make it better and better and better. And we, I think, come face to face with our limitations. Mm. on every script. I mean, I watch Friends, mainly what I see are the things I wish we'd changed. <laughs> right. But that's an artist, though. That's always the way it is. Right, yeah. right. But I think that's part of it. And I think, I mean, in, in my case, I actually had a teacher write on a paper once that I was the least, in my AP English, I was the least perceptive student she'd ever had, and I'd never be a writer. <laughs> Those are the best stories ever. I love those stories, <laughs> but that but that that kind of fed the the fire a bit. I'm I'm imagining. Well, what I realized is I can't write an essay. Right. I can't, I can't write an essay. I can write dialogue, mm-hmm. but I cannot write it. I couldn't write a novel. For I just couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. I write, you know. Dialogue. That's what I do. I act it out in my head. I play all the characters, and and I it's it's you know in shorter sentences. You know I don't have to be descriptive. I have to be clever mm-hmm. in how I um, do exposition and right. stuff like that. Um, so I think that's and that's certainly another piece of it for me. I haven't yet met a writer who doesn't feel the imposter syndrome. I, I really haven't either. I, I, yeah. I, it's just, and it's not, again, it's not just the writers. I think directors do too. I mean, I mean, maybe James Cameron not, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but even in the quiet moments of James's, mo- you know, I'm sure there was a moment like, no, nah, I don't think so. I think, no, I think he's good. I think. <laughs> But most, but most mortals, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. most mortals uh, do feel that, especially as artists are concerned. Is there anything you wish you would have been, you wish someone would have told you at the beginning of your career? I'm like, man, why didn't someone tell me this? 
there are a few things I wish someone had told me. Um, I wish someone had told me that there was going to be misogyny that I could do very little about. I can imagine. I wish someone had told me that. Um, and, and I faced it a lot. I'll tell you one story. We were writing a movie and, um, I had to, uh, had to have a minor a benign tumor removed from my breast and it was happening on the day that we were supposed to meet with the producer for whom we were writing this movie. And David sat down with this producer and he said, I love the script. I wish it had more TNA. Then he said, by the way, where's Marta? And David said, she's having her tea operated on today. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I can imagine in, in, you know, the 90s, 80s and 90s, that, you know, there was no Me Too movement. There was no awareness. There was no real way. There was nowhere for for females and people of color um, to... Yeah. There was no out. There was nothing. You just had to deal with it and move forward. And we didn't really have role models. I mean, mine was Rosemary from the Dick Van Dyke Show. M- Mine's was Robert Rodriguez from El Mariachi. It's the first time I ever saw a Latino filmmaker. Re- I mean, there had been before, but Robert was wow. the first guy I saw. I was like, oh my god, I can I can be a filmmaker. I can go out and do what I want to do. Right. And it was, you know, I'm sure Spike Lee was for other people and and and, and, and of, of of a certain generation. You know, um, Melvin Van Peebles and the list goes on and on. But um, you didn't see a lot. Now it's, I mean, so much more. There's still much more to be done, but there's so much more representation out there. There's so many more different stories told from different perspectives, um, which are so important. I think there is finally an awareness that we need to do that, that all people need to tell their stories. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, And that there's an audience for that. Oh, yes, <laughs> exactly. It, because at the end of the day, it generally always, you know, I, I, I had a, I had, when I, I, I came up in a video store, uh, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, I, I worked in a video store. And there was one moment where I, um, there was a, I, I had some, I had a racist situation happen with a customer. And they called up my own, my boss and my, and he's like, I can't believe this Latino kids telling me I have late charges or something like this. And, uh, I, I was the first time I'd ever really been, you know, in front, fronted with that. And he said, I'm going to tell you one lesson. He was a Jewish man. And he said, the only color that people care about is green. If you can make the money, it all goes out the window in a lot of ways. And, I found that that's generally the way it works <laughs> in Hollywood specifically. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with that? Like they just like if you're making a lot of money for the company or for the movie or for things, doors. They, I'm not doors, but just I don't know. It's I, I don't know. I, I would just love to hear your opinion on that. Yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, um, after during Friends. Um, you know, David and I would go to a meeting and there were certain men who would not look at me really? in the meeting. They would talk straight to David. And I'd be sitting right there talking. And they'd look at me when I talk, but then they would talk to David. Wow. Um, and you had the biggest had, show on, you had the biggest show on television. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it's gotten better. I have seen, um, a real change since I started in this business <laughs> in the eighties. Sure. Of course. Um, it's, it's been massive and I still think we have a very long way to go, but I feel like finally people are paying attention and I won't get things like we were pitching a movie um, where there were two women at the center of the movie. And the executive said to us, if it isn't Sandra Bullock and Mer- Meryl Streep, you're not getting the movie made. Nobody wants to see a movie about two women unless it's those two. Even now? Or is this, is this-, uh, this one was maybe six or seven years ago. Still close enough. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah. the other th- that's another thing I want people listening to understand. I mean, you've obviously had a lot of success in your career. It, it doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want. And a lot of, fil- a lot of writers think that like, Oh, well you wrote friends and, and, and Grace and Frank and you do what you basically, all you gotta do is make a phone call and you get something financed and you get something produced. 
I've talked to every, I've talked to Oscar winners, I've talked to all these people. It's not the case. They all have to hustle. They even, even well into their seventies, I've had people that are like, yeah, I, I still lose jobs. I, yeah, I still get and, rewritten. And it's actually one of the pieces of advice I was going to say mm -hmm. to young writers is you can never rest on your laurels ever, ever. Um, you know, because the next minute you're out there developing. And for whatever reason, just because you're an Oscar winner doesn't mean they're going to buy the movie. Correct. Correct. Um, I mean, we went through a year of development this year that was sheer hell. Not the development part of it, but the part where, you know, the Disney Plus says, yes, that's what we want. And we write it and they go, we don't want that anymore. <laughs> we now we want the Mandalorian. Right. We had quite a few of those kinds of experiences. We actually were writing something. We pitched something um, about a pandemic, but it's not really about the pandemic. It's about it. it anyway, it's based on a book. Sure. Um, we pitched it right after the news from Wuhan came out. Oh, yeah, exactly. They bought it. We wrote it. Yeah, no. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, we're not doing that. There's nobody wants to watch a pandemic no. show. Nobody. No. <laughs> we're moving. Well, I mean, that's the other thing that happens is you get caught. Um, life, life, the world. You, know, you have a great idea and you go pitch it and they go, oh, we have an idea about brothers, even if they're completely different. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, I'm assuming there were a lot of terrorist um, scripts were shelved after 9-11. Like, I, that's true. I, it's just, it's, you know, it happens. Things happen in the world. And, and then also sometimes yeah. the opposite happens. There's a script about something that all of a sudden you have Mandalorian <laughs> and they're like, oh, we're looking for that. And it just happened to be the timing for it. So timing works. And there's also, there's also a tendency to, oh, that worked. Let's do more of that. <laughs> of course. That's Hollywood's bread and butter. <laughs> Rather than let's find something new and fresh and exciting, let's just do what's good. It's no, it's got to be Ted Lasso. <laughs> oh God! I, how many Ted Lassos? By the way, Ted Lasso is absolutely phenomenal. I just finished binging it for the first time. Terrific. Oh, it's wonderful! But now I'm sure how many Ted Lasso ripoffs are going to come out. I mean, I always I always go back to Pulp Fiction. How many Pulp Fiction ripoffs were there once Pulp Fiction came right. out? I think there was right. like five or ten movies that came out. They're all trying to be Pulp Fiction because that's just the way Hollywood works. Um, right. But so I have to ask. So I have to, you know, the question I've, I've been wanting to ask you is how did you come up with Friends? How did Friends come to be? How did it get produced? How did someone say, "Sure, six kids living in New York. I think it'll be okay." How? What's the story behind that? I'm sure you've answered this question a, a couple times. <laughs> um. So. Basically, we had just finished doing Dream On, mm -hmm. which was a show with a single lead who had to be in every scene, um, which was extremely difficult on him. Every imagine. scene he was in. Um, so David and I said, the next thing we do is going to be an ensemble. Okay. We, don't, we don't want to do that. And we started developing some stuff. Um, we did a couple of pilots that obviously didn't work out. And then we were doing, this was our second year of development. And we started thinking about where we came from. We lived in New York. We were, um, part of a group of six people who did everything together. Um, in that case, four of them turned out to be gay, which was a shock, honestly, at the time. We were like, really? Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, but um, we were extremely close. And then I was here in LA driving down the street and I saw a sign for Insomnia Cafe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's, that's where to go. You know, the place you go get coffee is the place to go talk and to be together and to, you know, it just felt like 
besides the apartments, which you always see, this is this is the meeting place. This is the gathering place. Um, we actually um, sold it to two places, ended up at NBC, obviously. Um, and there was a period of time right after we did the pilot where they said, you know, we're worried about doing a show about six young people that's not going to get the audience except for young people. Can you bring in an older character? Maybe the guy who owns the coffee shop, the coffee house. You're Schneider. <laughs> yeah. We used to call him Pat the cop. Um, <laughs> and we said, no, you don't need that. Um, they are everything for each other. They are their community. Um, they don't need to go to some old guy for advice or woman. Um, they don't need to go to someone for advice because they have each other. And they let us do it. And how, so at what point, you know, in the casting process, did you go, oh, we have something special here? Was it after the first pilot? I mean, because that, that magic that that cast has, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying anything revolutionary here, but the magic of the, of the Friends cast is so paddable. You could just, you can sense it. When these six people got together, it just worked in a way that is unexplainable. Like you couldn't write, you literally couldn't write that as a story. It's, 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 True. That, you know, it was, it, it was not easy to cast. Mm -hmm. We saw 140,000 people. I mean, it was, it was not an easy Jesus. show to cast. Yeah. Um, but at our first rehearsal, the first time all six of them were on stage together, I got a chill up my spine and sort of went, holy shit. Really? That this early? You felt it. It was the first time they were all on stage together. So you guys didn't do chemistry reads or anything like that. You just you just cast them individually and then threw them together and what happened happened essentially. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Alchemy happened. That yeah, it's gold, yeah. yeah. Little gold. And this is one of those cases the stars were aligned. Mm -hmm. Things could have been different. The stars were aligned. Yeah, wasn't there like, uh, wasn't, is it Jennifer that was on another show or? Jennifer was on another show, yeah. And she um, had to get, she had to get out. And I think, I, I think, I, I think it was in the reunion I just saw this year that she said, yeah, you'll never, yeah, go to that show. You'll get canceled after yeah. <laughs> a year or something like that. That show's not going to make you a star. That's the quote. That's the quote. Yeah, that's the show that's not going to make you a star. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, that, um, and that was the thing, too, with that show, with the characters. They were all so beautifully balanced. You know, you had the flighty one. You had, the you know, the serious, you know, the, the not as bright one, the too bright one. Like, you balanced the characters. I mean, just the balance that you and David were able to put together of the characters. Just on a character development standpoint, how did you develop each of those characters? Or did this cast bring in some flavors that you later added and developed more with them or did, were they pretty fleshed out originally on paper? The, the, the answer is a, a little bit of both. Okay. Um, look, a character you write is one thing in your head. Right. And then when an actor breathes life into it, they bring something to it and it elevates it. And especially with this cast, they elevated everything. One example is we didn't originally write Joey as stupid. <laughs> but he played it so well yeah. that it just became part of who he was. And that was not in our initial description of him. So he wasn't originally the dim one. Correct. Yeah, but he was the actor. He was an actor. He was an actor. Yeah. He was so brilliant. <laughs> Dr. Actor. Jake Romano. Uh, <laughs> I mean, oh God! And did all those lines? I mean, there's so many. I mean, the list of quotable lines from that show. Were any of them ad libbed, or were they all broken in a room with with the writers? Do you remember that you can remember, like, you know, how you doing, and all these kind of things? Like, is that? You know, we may have written how you doing, but but the way he did it, 
right. is what made it incredibly special. How you doing is a line is like whatever. Uh, how many people have said, I mean, we say that, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah. 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 But his uh, performance made it. His performance made it. Yeah, and anytime you refer to that, you never hear someone go, oh, yeah, that line, how you doing? I was like, how you doing? Like, everyone does <laughs> Everyone does right, that. Right. And and to find six characters, six actors who melded so beautifully together and stayed um, best friends, really, to this day, such good friends is almost unheard of in a series environment for 10 years without somebody wanting to kill somebody. Look, it's, look, it's family. We all get, families are families. We all have, you know, fights and things like that. But generally speaking, they all stayed together um, for the entire show. Yeah. Uh, it's remarkable. It, it is, it is, I don't remember another series that had this kind of ensemble. And the other thing that I found so fascinating about the show is there really wasn't a breakout star, and I don't mean that in the bad way, because they all were breakout stars, and that's unheard of, you know? Uh, it's your experience as well? Yeah, my experience as well, and, you know, it was also, when we cast it, we didn't want to cast a star. Right. We didn't want someone who was going to pull all the attention towards themselves, um, you know, by an audience. We wanted six people who worked as a unit who made the characters come to life um, and who could, you know, hopefully meld. And, and you just don't know. You don't know until you do it, but, but you it, know. It worked out. It did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, it did work out. and Courtney was the only, to my knowledge, was the only kind of known person at that time because she had been she had been you know in some movies and obviously the Bruce Springsteen uh, music video and she'd been around for a little bit um, yeah. at that point but she wasn't a star per se she was a known Correct. actress Correct. Correct. Now, what is it like can you discuss the process of breaking an episode in the Friends writers room like how did you from season one to like season eight like what are the main differences from breaking that first season as opposed to breaking the eighth or ninth or tenth season well, the biggest difference is in the first season, you're making the arcs. You're creating the relationships between people. Um, by the time you get to the eighth season, uh, A, you really know who they are. Right. And B, there are things in the works. And what starts to happen is the show begins to tell you what the stories are. Interesting. You know, the, the show tells you which direction to go in. For example, uh, our idea with Monica and Chandler was they have a one night stand and then it gets really, really awkward. But the audience reaction when we shot it was so huge. Oh, we had to go, wait a minute. What are they telling us? <laughs> yeah. And we had to switch courses. Um, but we had to, you know, you have to be incredibly flexible along the way. That's number one. In terms of breaking a story, you know, it's a bunch of funny people sitting in the room going either, you know what might be funny? <laughs> um, and then it's spitballing and spitballing and spitballing. And sometimes it's, I gotta tell you what happened last weekend. <laughs> right. And they bring it. Yeah. Uh, as an example, the Taylor story. Mm -hmm. Joey and the Taylor. Oh, God, that was amazing. I remember, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. That, was, that was a true story. That's a true that story? Yeah. <laughs> he, went, he went a little too far up and he's like up in the yeah. ball. <laughs> true story. And you guys, well, it has to be Joey who has this, opera, this problem. <laughs> of course it does. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, because I remember when, uh, I mean, look, I've seen the show, I've probably rewatched it a ton of times over the years since the first viewing and when it hit Netflix and when it hit HBO Max and I just, you know, watch it over. Now my kids watched it. My kids are, uh, well, I think when they started watching it, uh, they shouldn't be watching because it's inappropriate because they were eight. But we'd fast forward and they couldn't get a lot of the references. But they would now, even to this day, they'll see Jennifer Aniston somewhere. I'm like, oh, there's Rachel or there's Joey. Or there's Chandler, yeah. and they, that's that's how they refer to the actors yeah. now because they just that's yeah. all they know. It's generational now. It's like one of those things that 
will be brought along to other yeah. to generate and that doesn't happen very often in television I, I, you know i have a, a my youngest daughter is 23 now but when she was 16 and the show went to netflix um a friend of hers said <laughs> Have you heard about that new show called Friends? Yeah, I've heard that. I heard about that. They thought it was a period piece. <laughs> they thought, yeah, they thought like this is a great new show. I remember when they hit yeah. Netflix, the millennials were just like, "This is fantastic! This this period piece show. They're talking about CDs and stuff. This is amazing." <laughs> <laughs> and the phones were this big. The phones were this big, and they used to go someplace and sit down. It's amazing. It's. I heard about that. Couldn't stop laughing when I heard that. It's 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 remarkable. I have. Do you have a favorite episode? I know that's hard to say with hundreds of episodes. Is there something? Is there one that you're just like, that's the one that really did it for me? You know, it's a little bit like saying, "Do you have a favorite child?" But yes, I, I do have a favorite, favorite episode. <laughs> um, the episode with the game and oh yes, the embryos. The, em the embryos? When um, the other part is um, Phoebe is getting um, her eggs fertilized. Right. Her brother's sperm. Of course. Um, <laughs> that's the other piece of the story that's in there. But it was the game. It was, you mean the game when they lost the apartment? Yeah. Oh, my, it's, it's, that's an amazing episode one of many but that i love that episode so much i love it so much it's 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 perfection uh, i i want to ask I like you the ones i love too mm -hmm. um but but that to me is that's just my favorite now is there something that you look for specifically in a potential writer for one of your rooms yes what which what is it <laughs> that i can be in a room with that person for 12 hours a day mm-hmm um, no matter how good the writing is, if the person is obnoxious or uh, too shy <laughs> or, or too shy, it's true, mm -hmm. or, or afraid to talk, um, I won't hire that person. Look, you read a script, you respond to it or you don't. Correct. Part of what happens is as you start to put together a writer's room, you go, all right, this person is really strong on story. This person's really good at jokes. So the script I read of that person may have been hilariously funny with not a great story, but that's okay in a writer's room. Right. You're taking the best pieces. You're taking the best pieces. Right. You want to balance. You want to balance. And I also feel that when people stay with a show, they start to, you know, gain depth as writers. Of course. You know, and, and learn. And learn to strengthen their weaknesses and show their strengths. I mean, the best advice I've ever gotten for being in this business is don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> best advice I've ever gotten and it's and people are like oh you've got to be super talented I'm like that helps don't be a dick it does, but I promise you true. you could be the, the best writer you could be the second coming of William Goldman <laughs> and if you are an ass and you can't work with them in any in any any field in our business grip gaffer DP director writer if you're hard to work with it, even and, and maybe you get in. I've always seen this too. Maybe your talent gets you in, and then you become the dick. Yeah. The yeah. moment you stumble, the second you stumble, you're gone. And it'll be, yeah. It, we we and I I feel that you're right. It's about the whole business. I mean, as a showrunner, one of my priorities is a happy set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A safe and happy set. Mm -hmm. And anybody who can't participate in that can't stay on the show. There's nobody yells. There's no yelling, period, end of story. You don't yell. Right. You know, there's, and, and there are ways, it, it's being a showrunner sometimes is like being a camp counselor. Mm -hmm. Um. Not always, but sometimes that is what it feels like when you're sort of 
supporting, uplifting, cheering on your cast and crew um, to make them feel good about coming to work every day. It's not easy. A lot of people think, I mean, look, at Hollywood and being in the, sh- in the show business and, and television, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. And I know you know that as well. It's fun. But it's hard work. You work 12, 18-hour days sometimes. Right. Yeah, everyone's well compensated and all that's all great and dandy. But at a certain point, it doesn't matter how many how many dollars come into your checking account. It's still 18 hours. And you're still right. busting your your butt. And you and I can't even imagine the, pre- the financial pressure of being a producer on a show like that. Right. That, you know, right. because... At a certain point, it was one of the, the most expensive uh, shows on NBC's roster at, at a certain point. You know, they were making a lot of money with it as well. But that pressure, as, lo- as well as trying to be creative, as well as trying to keep a happy set, people don't think about things like that. But it is an immense amount of pressure. I can't even understand at this point. It's true. It's, it's a lot of pressure. It's a, enormous stress. But, and I would say this to a young writer, we work too hard not to find joy in what we do. Mm-hmm. Agreed. As a writer, if whatever you're working on doesn't speak to you, it's not going to come out well and you're not going to be happy doing it. Yeah, absolutely. It's right. got to be something that you feel in your soul, in your gut, that this is something I have to write. Well, I have to tell you, my new obsession is Grace and Frankie. And I, my wife and I watching it and I saw the trailer for it when it came out originally and I jumped on, I think I jumped on season one. I, I was an early adopter and I was just sitting there going, how in God's green earth did this get made? I can't, I'm so happy it did. On paper, it doesn't play well, but you know, you mean like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's, it's something that you never see. You never see people of of that age on on a show obviously you i think you did, had the same luck that you had with dream on hbo was the wild wild west i think uh and netflix was very much the wild wild west to a certain extent it still is the wild wild west over there and you pitched them the show i'm so happy that it exists in the world and we're obsessed with it by the way so thank you for making it um how did you how did grace and frankie come to be how did that idea come to be because some of the ideas in that show are just wonderful. <laughs> um, well, it, it was kind of a fluke how it started. Um, I had lunch with a woman named Marcy Ross, who was um, head of the television department at Skydance. Um, we'd known each other previously. Um, and she said that Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin want to do TV. I thought she meant together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I called my agent and I said, is it true that Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin want to do a show together? And she goes, I don't know. I'll call you back. And 20 minutes later, she calls me back and she says, they do now. <laughs> <laughs> because you were asking. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also because they hadn't thought about doing it together, you know, and it was like, they're friends. Of course. They were very excited about it. And then, you know, we knew certain things. We knew we wanted it to be about what it is to be that age, sex and sexuality and friendship. Um, And we had a few paths to it. Um, And I was sitting in the car with, my daughter who is now a VP of my company because she's so freaking good. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's the one who said, what if they um, are women who don't like each other, their husbands work together in a law firm and the men fall in love and want to get married. She's the one that came up with that. What? Oh my God. (laughs) What? That's amazing, and and the I mean Martin and uh, Sam. It, it just it just. It, it, I got to tell you, Alex. There were days <laughs> we would do table reads, and I would look across the table. Right. Sam Waterston, and Lily Tomlin, and Jane Fonda, and Martin Sheen, and I would go, "What? <laughs> What's going on? What is this real?" 
it's 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 remarkable and the topics you i mean i've never seen a show like that because it's just something you never see characters of that age on on television as the main star just just it doesn't happen there's usually a side character um but there's that then the topics they cover like you're talking sexuality that's taboo you don't talk about things like that and then that they open up a vibrator company is just the most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life. And then the toilet thing. And oh, my God, it's just every you season know, keeps getting was, better. It was all for us about life starts at any age. Right. Um, and also it was a little bit about no one talks about dry vaginas, but they're a real thing. <laughs> right. You're right. You never talk about them. And, you know, on Netflix, you can talk about it. Right, this is not going to happen on 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 a, on a network show. Network <laughs> that's, that's the case in fantasy, it would not happen on on any of the major networks. That's just not going to happen. But you know, by the way, did you? I'm sure you've seen it at this point. The SNL rap. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's so that made us so happy. We watched it in the writers' room, and we were just so happy about it. Oh my god, Pete Davidson! It's just the it was the best. If anyone's not, I, if, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It is when I saw it because I'm a fan of Saturday Night Live, so I was watching it. I'm like, are they are they are they doing a rap about Grace and Frankie? This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And that Jane and Lily showed up at the end. <laughs> I know it, it it made us so happy. That's when I knew I'd made it. Yeah, that, it's now crossed yeah. over because that's the thing. It's and because on paper, it's not a great pitch. Don't get me wrong; it's not a great pitch on paper because you're like, well, it's only going to a certain. This is what the, the studios would say: it's only a certain demographic's going to watch this. Only an older generation. That's not kind of the generation that we're going after. But their biggest fan base is young millennials. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and Gen X like myself and like and everyone in between because yeah. good story writing. It's good story. Good acting is good acting. Well, it's you know, similar to Friends when they said, you know, you can't do a show about six young people. Right. Out, we've always said, and this was the case with Grace and Frankie too, if the stories are identifiable, if you can connect with the characters and the stories are something you can empathize with, then it'll work no matter how old they are. You're absolutely right, and 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 that you have the record now of the longest running show on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. Um. There is no other show, no other show that's ever done it, and that was the thing in the rap too. I love that. <laughs> that means it was like, and the longest running show on Netflix as well. <laughs> Again, if on 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 paper you would have told me, oh yeah, this is also going to be the longest running show on Netflix because Netflix is infamous for one two seasons you're out. Right. Two, three seasons, you're out. If you can make it to four or five, my God, you're at this point, you're Orange is the New Black or a House of Cards, you know. Right. But this little show, and it's not that little, but this little show about, you know, older people talking about dry vaginas and vibrators, <laughs> it's now <laughs> the longest running show on Netflix. I mean, do you, do you believe, I mean, I think you said it already, it's like it identifies and crosses the generations. And that's why I think it people connect with it so much. And I mean, obviously, it's the performances as well. And Jane and Lily and Martin and Sam are just their magic as well. You've you've hit you've hit the lottery twice. I did. It's, I did. I'm I'm very grateful and very lucky. So I have to ask you. Um, I heard the rumors. Is Dolly showing up? Dolly is. It is official out there. Yes. Because on season three, I'm like, when is Dolly going to show up as a cameo? Jesus, somebody bring Dolly back. Please, I want to see the three of them again. Because I'm of a generation that remembers 9 to 5. I love yeah. 9 to 5. I watched it, oh God, so many times. It just was, it's one of those movies at that time. That movie was a monster hit. Uh, yeah, it was huge. It was huge. It was, huge. It was, it was in the zeitgeist at, the, at that moment yeah. in time. And the three of them are so magical together. I cannot wait to see the. Th I, I, I'm just dying to see what you guys do with them. Um, and when are um, when is the show with the final episodes? Because I already binged the second the, you you teased out a few episodes. So that's this last season. Yeah, we teased out four. I don't have an official date yet. Okay. Um, um, I, I don't have an official date yet. Hopefully, in the next. I, I think it's going to be in the next few months. 
next few months. So yeah, as of this week, we're recording this in January. So hopefully in April sometime. April, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, hopefully around April sometime it'll come out. And yeah. uh, how many episodes are left? Um, six? 12. Oh, 12 total? 12 left. We were six, oh. It was 16 episodes oh. for our final season. Oh, God. Oh, that's amazing. So you got extra. Because there's normally, what was the normal episode run? 13. So you got three. Oh, it's so good. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to watch Grace and Frankie again. See where this where this this story. I'm so, no seriously. It's like there's very few shows that I get obsessed about. Uh, Grace and Frankie. I'm also rest, uh, obsessed about Cobra Kai uh, <laughs> because it's Cobra Kai. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but it is is um, I don't get obsessed by shows. Oh, and Yellowstone too. I don't know if you've seen Yellowstone. I haven't yet. I I'm I'm having my knee replaced. I'm saving it for that. Oh, it's oh Taylor is oh. It's amazing, amazing writing. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my, my guests. What advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Well, a, a couple things. One is before you take scripts out there, mm -hmm. get some friends together and read it out loud. <laughs> um, so that you know how you have a product that is actable. And then I would say, and I know there's a lot of controversy about this. Um, I, I think agents can be extremely useful. Um, I happen to have had a very good experience with mine. Um, other people have had good experiences. Some have not. I understand that. But um, I think getting an agent is really important. And that's by the, one of the ways you do that is knowing other writers who can say, hey, I met this person who has a great script. And to do that, I really think getting into a writer's room, being a writer's assistant, start as a writer's PA if you have to, be a writer's assistant. We had every writer's assistant we had except for one ended up being a writer on the show. On which show? Grace and Frankie or Friends Grace or both? Frankie. Grace and Frankie. Great. Well, we had quite a few on Friends as well, but on Grace and Frankie, everyone. Really? That's awesome. Um, a woman who started as a writer's PA ended up as a producer in our last season. How does, and how, I have to ask, how do you go from writer's PA to producer in the scope of the series? Like, what, so people listening can understand what she did that... Well, in, in my room, I run a very democratic room. Okay. And if a writer's assistant has a joke to pitch, I want to hear it. Okay. Um, I, you know, I want to hear what they have to say. If a writer's assistant has an idea, the room may not necessarily be the right place to do it, but then pull me aside and say, you know, I was thinking, what about this? And then we can go back in the room and I can say, Brooke just had this amazing idea. Because there is that poli um, there is that politics of the room that that that's not spoken about a lot. It's like how to you know, especially there's a showrunner side of the of the room, but then there's the writer side and how to politically do it without stepping on toes and egos and things like that. You well, know, it depends on the showrunner. Exactly. It depends on the showrunner. If you have a showrunner with an ego, I, I, it's tough. But you still would learn a lot in a writer's room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and start to get to know writers. I mean, I, a lot of my writers were working with the writer's assistants, reading their scripts, giving them advice. That's great. Um, mentoring them almost. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's great. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Wow. That's a really interesting question. Uh, and I could go in a bunch of directions. I'm not going to go to the dark place. Okay. <laughs> you know, bringing it full circle, I think I learned that I'm a writer. Took you a while to figure that out? Yeah. Took me a long time. Really? Yep. I want everyone listening to hear this. <laughs> that... Someone as, as accomplished as you had a long time to figure out that they were really a writer, that that imposter yeah. syndrome was was bad. 
Yeah. Do you still deal with it? You have to not deal with it as oh, much. Yeah, I do. Do you still deal with it? Really? Absolutely. But you, but you figured out like that's just a voice in my head. I, I I'm a writer. Yeah. Yeah, I figured out. All right, I've done it before. I can do it again. Um, and just get words on paper. Just get words on paper, and then rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Are there three pilots that everyone should read in their specific genre that you would recommend? Um, you know, my so-called life was an amazing pilot. It was. I remember it. That was an amazing pilot. Uh, I learned a lot from watching that pilot. Um, so that's one. Mm-hmm. Um, Squid Game had a pretty good pilot. Jesus. <laughs> what the hell with that? Jesus Christ, that show. What a thing. Like, how well, like, I don't even, we, I, I have to do it. I have to get that show runner on the show. I'm just, if he speaks English, I want to speak to him. And you know, I, it's funny that I mentioned those because I don't watch a lot of comedies. Okay. I mainly watch dramas because watching comedy is work for me. <laughs> right. You're analyzing it. You're picking it apart. Exactly. You're, you're like, oh, that didn't exactly. hit right. That didn't hit right. Why did that right. get through? <laughs> or how'd they get to that? How's that? The story wise, that doesn't make any sense or whatever it is. <laughs> right. So, you know, all right. So, so mostly drama. So Squid Games, uh, My So-Called Life. And what's, what's the third one you think? I'm debating between a couple. Okay. You could toss them both out. Sopranos had an amazing pilot. David was, I mean, Jesus. <laughs> genius, genius. But I have to say, I recently watched a show that I've long since forgotten about. The pilot for Lost is really oh, good. Yes, it is. The, the pilot was amazing. Amazing. Oh, oh it's re- remarkable. I mean, they yeah. kind of... You know, it took them. It, they they went off. They went off the rails a little bit. They do. They didn't know where they were going. <laughs> they were just like, and a smoke monster shows up. Like I get. <laughs> <laughs> but that first season was yeah. some of the best television. Uh, yeah, it was great. In a long time, I always throw in Breaking Bad because I think it's one of the. Oh, that's a really good. I pilot. mean, you you add another fifteen yeah. minutes to it, and it's the, it's it's the best independent film of that year. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's remarkable, and just for fun, three of your favorite films of all time. <laughs> and she's wiggling you know, in her chair. She's wiggling in her chair. I am. <laughs> I am. Um, I loved. There's so many, I, and some of these may be a little controversial. To, to Kill a Mockingbird. It's a fantastic film. Is an amazing film. My favorite film made from a book. Okay. Um, now this one's a little strange. The original West Side Story. Okay. Which I grew up on. I will sometimes just watch the dances. Oh, they're so beautiful. They're amazing. They're so good. Did you see the new uh, one, by the way? Did you see Stevens? I did. Yeah, I, I did. hear. I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I hear it's phenomenal. <laughs> watch it, and then we can have a conversation. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, and what was that? And what's another one? Um, what was the first one I said? The favorite? Uh, to, mo- to kill a mockingbird. Oh, the favorite. Uh huh. Oh, the favorite. Uh, oh, which one? The the one with Olivia Coleman. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Okay. I loved that. Movie. I haven't seen that movie in forever, but yeah, I remember that movie. Oh, it was just. Oh, and I also loved Arrival. I do love science fiction. I watch a lot of science fiction. Really? I thought Arrival was great. See, now you never think that Marta Kaufman's like a big sci fi fan. (laughs) Huge, huge sci fi fan. Did you see that? Have you seen Mandalorian? Do you you watch any of that stuff or no? I do. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's fun. Yeah. It's it's popcorn. It's popcorn. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's popcorn. It's fun. It's, you know, it's not changing. You watch while you're eating dinner. Right, it's not a, it's not going to change the world, but man, is it fun! Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> and and I just started watching the book of Boba, and I'm just like, 
it's fun as hell, man. It, there, you, I saw I saw this meme of of it, it's like kids playing with Star Wars toys, and it's like J- uh, John Favreau, David Fillion, and then making the Mandalorian. <laughs> They're just literally having <laughs> the fun playing with their t- Star Wars toys, and someone's filming it. That's really fun. Um, Marta, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and it has been thank uh, you, Alex. And I appreciate been, your thoughtful questions. It is. It was wonderful talking to you, and continued success thank you again for bringing friends into the world and also uh, grace and frank and i cannot wait to see what you're up to next so thank you again so much thanks so much bye